Good morning. My name is Matthew Johnson, and I am the pastor here at Glencoe United Methodist Church. And I want to welcome you back to our final virtual worship service for now. The reason I say it's our final virtual worship service is because starting next week, September 20th, we will be entering into this space again. We will not be coming into the sanctuary to worship, but we will be worshiping out here in our parking lot. We will worship together in this space, on this campus. We will be separated because we're going to do social distancing. You're going to bring your own chair, hopefully. If you don't, we might can try to scrounge up one or two for you. Um, and we ask that you wear a mask. There will be some different rules to everything because we're trying to prevent any spread of infection or anything like that. And I sent out an email explaining these things. And if you have questions based on that, please let me know. If you haven't received an email from me, then either you're not on our email list or two, you don't use email and I'm trying to get those letters to you as soon as possible. So look out for me to show up at your house or at least call you and uh, to let you know about what's going to happen by giving you the same letter that would have been sent out via email. Also, let's not forget about the Glencoe Prayer Loop, which shows up on Mondays at 1 o'clock via phone. And what we'll do is, if you, you should have gotten an access card in the mail, and you just type in the phone number, and then it'll say, what's the, the password or access code? You type that in, and then it puts you straight into the conversation. And then we can lift people up in prayer requests and praises together. So no matter how separated we are, we can all still be connected, which is a beautiful opportunity for us to continue to show each other love amidst this time of crisis. And friends, I just wanted to also emphasize that because of your hard, diligent work and dinner, generosity, you have produced a hundred hygiene kits that was sent to victims of natural disasters, particularly Hurricane Laura. I delivered those this past week on Thursday, and we had enough money to where we went out and bought a hundred kits worth, and I delivered them to Charlotte to the little hub there where they're going to send it out. So you should be very, very proud of this church and of all of you for your generosity and your help because it has impacted at least a hundred families during their times of crisis. So you should definitely give yourself a round of applause for that and praise be to God that we had the opportunity and had you and your generosity for this time. Friends, I'm looking forward to seeing you in person again. I'm looking forward to being in worship, even in person, if it's outdoors or whatever. We are going to be together again, and I am so happy that this is the case. But for now, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let us get through this worship service first, and then we will come together next week and lift up God in our praise and worship. Will you pray with me and let us begin worship at this time? Gracious and merciful God, we worship you together today in spirit and body so that way we can be your faithful people. Help us to see what you would have us to see. Help us to hear what you would have us to hear. Help us to feel your Holy Spirit within us and around us. May your spirit be our guidance and our inspiration in this world so that way we can be transformed by your grace and show the world what your love and mercy looks like. And let us have a true heart for you. Let us have the best intentions for you. And as we continue our sermon series this week on your son Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, speak to us so that way we can hear the words that Jesus would have been speaking to us then. Help us to understand you better, so that way we can serve you faithfully and loyally. Lord, we ask all these things through your Son, who is the Christ in which we pray this day and every day. Amen. 
Let us now worship, friends. Our first lesson today comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Hear now the word of God. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. He said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of Him? This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, let us not forget to do something that is very important in the life of the church, which is giving of our offerings and tithes. As we offer ourselves up each and every day, we must also remember to give financially so that way the church can continue to operate on a daily basis and to continue to serve in ministry opportunities to our community and to the world. It is important that we continue to do this because if we don't, then we cannot function as the church. Friends, if you have not given this week, please consider giving next week. If you have been giving, thank you. And we thank you for all that you've done for this church, as well as what you're continuing to do for your community. And if you have not paid, please feel free to write a check or to bring by some cash or pay online on our website, which is via PayPal. 
whatever is most comfortable to you. And then we can use that money to continue to do what we need to do as Glencoe Church for this community each and every day as God's people. Our gospel lesson today comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Hear now the word of God. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father, who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray, friends. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. 
Most of us are familiar with this prayer, right? Like it's often called the Lord's Prayer or Our Father Prayer if you're Catholic. And during our liturgies here at Glencoe, we often incorporate this prayer at the end of our communal prayer time, the time where we lift up prayer concerns of our families and friends that are dealing with hard times, as well as praises where we lift up these wonderful joys in our lives, whether it's something that happened to someone or just the fact that things are going well for a change. That is, of course, unless we have communion on that Sunday, then we recite it as part of our communion liturgy. It is that important that it is incorporated into that liturgy. And we pray this prayer so much that it can almost become habitual or even methodic, and sometimes it could lose its valuable meaning to us. You know, Emile Durkheim, a French sociologist, would probably say that by making the Lord's Prayer something that we just do rather than its intended purpose means that we are allowing it or something in this case to that should be sacred become profane. Or another way of putting this would be mundane or routine instead of profane. And when coronavirus is not plaguing the world and we are actually able to worship normally in our churches, it's not abnormal for activities or words to take on less meaning than it did before because we overuse it or we just get set in a routine or we follow the motions as some people would say. Now, I'm not going to spend the next few minutes telling you how you should pray because as we saw in Matthew 6, Jesus himself does that. And who am I to tell you how to pray? I'm not the Lord, and I'm not the Savior of humanity. I am just another person living in a world of sin. And I sin every day just like each and every one of you, and for me to sit here and tell you how to pray would be irresponsible of me. Instead, I want to take this time to talk about the importance of the intentionality the intentionality of when we pray, or the prevention of the sacred turning into the profane. Now, in today's scripture, we read that Jesus is warning his listeners about not being like the hypocrites. He starts this off in chapter 6 discussing alms, then he moves to prayer as we are particularly focusing on today, and then he makes another shift towards fasting. And it is important that we understand that all three acts that Jesus is discussing were normal in the lives of the Jewish community. Being charitable to others, praying to God, and fasting were expressions of their faith, a lot like our faith today. And when we look back at the Israelites after the exodus from Egypt in in the book of Exodus, they enter into an agreement with with God, the one who delivered them from their bondage to a new life. Moses merely served as an intermediary between God and them with that role. And he delivered the law to the Israelites that God gave to Moses to give to them. And this law, which can be found throughout the rest of Exodus and all the way through Deuteronomy, focused on both honoring God and treating neighbors respectfully. And remember, Jesus had previously said in Matthew 5.17 that he did not come to abolish the law. But he came to fulfill it. So Jesus had a good understanding of what the law was and its intended purpose. And the fact that we know that Jesus was the Son of God and the ultimate rabbi to help us know how to interpret the law and to interpret the scriptures tells us that when Jesus spoke of these important matters, such as giving to the needy, praying to God, fasting, and other things of the sort, The disciples, and us today for that matter, were expected to listen. And the hypocrites that Jesus was referring to in his message were the religious leaders like the Pharisees and the scribes, or the legal experts, as it sometimes says in some translations. And the word used that translates into hypocrite in English was often used in the Greek as being described to as being a description of actors. And in the theater and in theater performances, uh, performers would actually wear masks to conceal their true selves from the audience. They are they're pretending to be someone else. Today we don't necessarily see masks all the time in the movies and in the shows and on theater, 
but we see them acting like someone else, not being themselves, concealing their true selves to be like somebody else instead or to show a different persona. And likewise, when Jesus is speaking of the hypocrites here, he is, all, he is talking about those who conceal their true intentions. And as far as Jesus was concerned, it's not the act themselves, but the intentionality behind those acts that were being performed that was so important. Jesus was not opposed to communal acts of piety and mercy. We need to make sure this is clear. I know he says that you should do it behind a closed door in a locked room, but the reason he said that was to make a stark contrast. He did not mean it literally per se. He was concerned about those actions being done for the purposes of building oneself up, aka making themselves look good or maybe even look, them, look more pious or more faithful than others. We actually see that in multiple parts of Scripture. And another one that you can think of is think about the Pharisee who is there and he's at the temple and then he sees this tax collector come up and he prays, the Pharisee prays this big prayer that is actually one that is saying, I'm better than this tax collector over here. Please, thank goodness I'm not like this tax collector. And he's saying it out loud and degrading this man in front of everyone. But he didn't do it because he truly thought it, though he probably did. The reason he did it was to make a point in the people around him, not in his conversation with God. So it's important that we notice that. Now, we've all seen men and women today, clergy, laity, you name it, who pray hardcore before meals and sometimes take what feels like 20 minutes to get the food blessed. Friends, growing up in the South has its perks. I mean, the food is amazing, but those prayers at reunions and such could make the very food that you were excited before, had your mouth watering, make it cold before you even get to the food table to get your food. <laughs> it happened often growing up. And not to mention, some, of, some people love to pray in ways that they would never pray otherwise. I mean, I have felt like it... I was at a Renaissance festival at times in my life. Yeah, I have never actually gone to one. Have I wanted to? Yes. Have I ever been? No. But when some people pray, they pray to God, and it's oftentimes in Old English, or they're trying to pray like they are reading straight out of the King James Bible, yet that's not how they speak to God. That's not usually how they pray to God, but they did it because they're in a crowd and they wanted it to sound good or look good or to make themselves look good. Happens all the time. Can't say I've not been guilty for it in the past. I'm just as guilty as everybody else. Now, I don't usually talk King James Version, but I have been known in my life to just go on and on because I wanted to make sure the prayer sounded fine. And that's part of my insecurities where I shouldn't really be insecure because it's just a conversation with me and God. But yet, I do it anyway. Now, when we pray to God, it doesn't matter what words we are putting up to God. Because as long as we are praying sincerely, you really don't have to be a poet. You don't have to be a musician or even a great public speaker in order to talk to God. And I think that people have harped on this in the past, and that's good, because this is an important aspect. And we should make sure that when we know that when we talk to God in the way we need to, which is when we come to God and say what we need to say. And if we can't think of the words, the words will come to God through our hearts because God knows what our hearts are going to say. But by saying them, it's better. But we shouldn't just say things for the sake of saying things. Prayer doesn't have to take a long time. It only needs to be as long as your conversation with God needs to be. It, is authentic, it needs to be authentic, and because God knows of our transgressions, our fears, our anxieties, our angers, our gratefulness, and our joys, any and all of our concerns and praises, God knows. Think of it like a relationship with your significant other, whether it's your husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whoever. They might know how you feel, but when you actually talk to them about how you're feeling and about what's going on, the, the relationship actually strengthens as a result. 
it, the bonds increase as a result. And the same thing is with God. When we talk to God, the better the bond, the better our relationship with God. And these moments where we talk to God through prayer are sacred because they are set apart from the rigors of this life. They are t- at times, they are times that are distinguished from our normal routine ways of life. In other words, they're special. They're set apart. Intentional prayer is when we sincerely communicate with God. Intentional prayer is not done to show off, but out of humility. Intentional prayer is a transforming time from your day, from being profane to the sacred. Intentional prayer is an opportunity to grow in our faith together with us and God. Intentional prayer is like what Paul said to the church in Thessalonica. It's ceaseless, and for that, it is an important to always give up ourselves to God in prayer. When he says, pray ceaselessly or never cease to prayer, he's not talking about pray every moment of your life. He's talking about be in sincere prayer as often as you can. Be in conversation with your God. Intentional prayer is also personal, and it should be treated as such. Whether you're praying in the open or behind closed doors, it needs to be personal. It doesn't need to be about other people. It needs to be about what's on your heart. If you care about how other people are feeling, it shows. You lift that up to God because you want that lifted up to God. If you are worried about yourself, you lift that up to God. You give it to God, which means that Intentional prayer is also being honest with the Lord our God. Intentional prayer is not speaking insignificant words, words that are just thrown up there to God. And in, intentional prayer is for everyone because we are all sinners and we are all God's creation. Jesus' lesson to his listeners was not necessarily to show them a way to pray, but it was a modeling the what prayer should look like, what that intentional prayer looks like. And he showed them what when praying that we should submit our whole selves to God. And it takes a great deal of humility and it takes a great deal of trust to acknowledge that dependency, especially when we live in a world that stresses independence and God is asking us to be dependent upon God. And in the Lord's Prayer, we start off by expressing how great God is, and then we ask for help, God's deliverance, which shows that dependency that we are talking about here. Let's not be like the hypocrites. Let's, let's not be deceitful when we are talking to others or praying or doing things in front of others, and let's not deceive ourselves. We should continue to have an open and honest conversation with God, and let's not be hypocrites and take the attention away from God by making ourselves more visible. Remember, Jesus told us that we are the salt and the light of the earth. Both light and salt are meant not to overpower. Likewise, they are not supposed to pull people away from God through our own selfishness. Instead, when we give to charities, when we help people in need, when we pray to God, when we perform acts of piety that are meant to show our love for God and our neighbors, it should be pointing directly up to God and not to a single person, not to a single church, not to a denomination. So let's not be hypocrites. Let's be faithful followers of Jesus. Let's be God's people in all that we do but especially when we pray, because that is what Jesus taught us to do in this scripture.
you go about your week this week, remember that God loves you and that God wants the best for you. But also remember to be intentional in who you are and what you do because the intention matters. Because what we do for God on God's behalf matters. We should not be lifting ourselves up in that, in that way. Instead, we should be lifting God up. God builds us up, and of course we should build each other up in, in that sense. But we should not build ourselves up, because that is boasting. That is showmanship. That is something we should not do. Friends, let us be Christ to the world. Let us show that love and mercy that God has bestowed upon us all so that way others can see who Christ is and come to Christ or grow in their relationship with Christ because these are important aspects of our faith. These are important aspects in our journey, in our faith as Christians as we attempt to seek out and follow the will of God in the world. Go in peace, friends. Serve the Lord always, and always give glory and thanks to God. Amen.